Hi everyone, my name is Ria Lala and my work and my joy is helping parents create richer, deeper connections with their children and building their emotional and building their emotional awareness, deepening it between parents and child. I wasn't always uh, into parenting. I, I did this for 15 years in the corporate world, and I realized that there were a lot of similarities that can translate from that into parenting. And I, I know that not everyone in this group is a parent. However, I'd love to leave you with some great hacks that you, whether you're a parent or not, can take home today and start using with your children or with your lover or your friends. So when we talk about emotional awareness, what we're really talking about is our EQ. And uh, there's a variety of different elements to emotional intelligence, but I'm gonna talk about the three that I think is most relevant to raising children uh, that are aware and connected and, and fosters a really strong relationship with their parents. So the first part of that is uh, how self-aware a child is. So when we talk about self-awareness, what are we talking about? We're talking about how aware is a child or anybody for that matter about the feelings that they're feeling and why. So for example, imagine a child who's doing a cartwheel and another child is observing that child doing the cartwheel, but they know they can't do it or they think they can't do it as well. And in that moment, they're feeling maybe some fear, maybe some insecurity, um, maybe some embarrassment. And so they just walk away and they go, no, I don't wanna do it. How aware is that child to know that that's what they're feeling in that moment and why that's occurring? The next part is how, how able somebody is to regulate, their ability to self-regulate. So once they can, are aware that they're feeling this feeling, can they, can they manage to process that emotion in a way that doesn't hijack them so they're not in an emotional flood where they're crying or they're upset or they're not in an emotional drought or desert where they're tuning out or they're cold or they're distant, or they've just shut down. And the next part of that is perspective taking, which is so important for parenting. And when I talk about perspective taking is how well can a child, or anybody for that matter, climb into somebody else's mind and look around and imagine what it's like, what their perception is of the world, and try and understand why they think and do the things they do. So that's what uh, Dan Siegel calls mind sight. Or, and, and that's where empathy comes from, how a child learns empathy, the ability to climb in. Okay, so what's the real world um, application of this and how does this foster uh, connections between children? And I'm gonna give you three examples that have happened, real world examples that have happened as I've worked with parents just in the last couple weeks. So I want you to imagine a child, in fact two children, and the mother decides to give each child a cookie. And so first child looks at his cookie, second child looks at his cookie, then looks over at his brother and says, he got a bigger cookie than I did. And in that moment, that brother starts to feel frustrated and angry. And all of a sudden he decides he's gonna pinch his brother just to feel better about the situation. So he pinches him. The grown up version would be maybe uh, somebody feeling, uh, shouting out mean words or saying something a little bit nasty to, because somebody else got an opportunity that they didn't. Or maybe they shut down and they're not as friendly or giving of information because they didn't get something. So in that moment, the mother who would be observing the son who pinched the other brother, she says to him, why would you pinch your brother? And that's not very nice. And you know, we really shouldn't pinch in this world. And then all of a sudden that brother who pinched feels shame and feels blamed and upset, and the whole thing escalates from there. <clears throat> when really, if that child had the ability, what he would have said is, Mom, I'm feeling really scared inside. I, I actually feel that you might love my brother more than me, and that makes me feel insecure. And I know that couldn't be true, but right now, that's how I feel, because he got the bigger cookie. And then what would happen? The mother would get down to his eye level and say, she would connect, and the way she would connect is by a bunch of, in a variety of ways. One is by nonverbal cues, because 80% of our communication is done nonverbally. So she would get down to his eye level, and she'd look at him, and she'd make sure her, her body language was open and accepting. She'd touch his hand, she'd look in his eyes, she'd say in a tone that was soft and engaging, 
I'm so sorry that that's what your perception was, or I'm so sorry that you feel that way. Tell me more about what's going on for you. I'd love to know. And all of a sudden, that child would have an opening where he could discuss everything that was happening without feeling any fear. But if the, if the child had the language to do so, that's what would ideally happen. I'm going to give you another scenario. Uh, a little while ago, I was, I was coaching a woman, and she said to me that her, her daughter is always clinging to her. And the mother told me that I don't think there's any amount of love that I can pour into my child that would, make, that would satiate her. And then... And, and the grown-up version would be pretty much the same, where you have a partner maybe or a friend or somebody that's just extra clingy and you kind of feel like, you know, that you want to kind of keep them away. But if the child had the language, they would be able, and the, and the parent had used some really good questioning and again got down to their eye level and became curious, put on their curious detective hat, the child would have said, I kind of feel like you don't want to spend time with me because you seem really busy. There's like a lot going on. I just want you to spend spend some time playing dolls, and then I'd feel like you really want me here, but you just, I don't think this is interesting or important to you. And then the mother could do everything she could do to heal that situation, right? And again, looking at her nonverbal cues, looking at the language that she's using, where she's curious and inviting. In my last scenario, I want you to imagine a child that's in a tantrum, and they're upset, and they're angry, and they're stomping around. And then the mother sees all this reaction and decides to put the child into time out. So the ch I, I, don't know, there, I don't know if, you've, if you know what happens to monkeys, but if you take a group of monkeys and one young monkey is acting up and you separate the monkey from the group, that monkey goes insane. So here we have a child who for whatever reason, maybe it's because they observed the kid doing a cartwheel better than they did and they just felt upset because their sadness and their fear and insecurity, their secondary emotion was anger because there's always sadness and fear under anger. We have to look at what the primary emotion is. So that mother would have probably brought that child close and got looked into his eyes and said, hey, tell me what's going on for you right now. I I'm so curious. I really want to know. I really want to understand what made, you, what made you scream and yell. And instead of putting the child in time out, they actually give him a time in where everything's soft and gentle and inviting. What's the similarities between all these situations? That there's always a conversation that's happening under the conversation. And if we look in all those scenarios, if there was self-awareness, so the child and the parent was able to understand what each one of them was feeling at any given moment, and why, if there was self-regulation, so that the mother, when she sees her child tantruming, doesn't go into her own tantrum or her own anger, and is able to soothe her nervous system so that she can soothe her child's nervous system, if the mother is, and this child is able to take perspectives, if the mother's really able to climb inside their child's mind to see what's going on for them. One thing that I find very helpful is to imagine that everything your children do, that there is a kernel of truth in it, that everything your children do that is what you might consider suboptimal, that there's, that there, that there's something that you're trying to gain from, get, um, gauge from you and uh, something there for you to understand. So one hack that uh, I think is very effective for parents is, you know, whenever you see somebody that's angry, like a child, to always lead with your right brain. So your right brain, which is your emotional side, the soothing, where you look at all your uh, nonverbal cues and you get down to their eye level. And it's only when you see that your child's system has been soothed and they're calm, then you read, lead with logic. And this applies for grown-ups as well. Too often we just go into some logical explanation as to how somebody should have handled something or what somebody should have done. And when really what people want to have is just to be heard. They just want to have their rants. They just want to you know, say what's ever on their mind, right or wrong. Soothe them and then lead with logic. And then you'll find that you can uh, calm situations down much more quicker. Uh, one question that I have found extremely useful for children is, and, I, and I've been asking my son this and daughter this since they were about you know, three and a half, four, is how can mommy love you better? How can mommy understand you better? And the reason why I find it so useful is because it employs all of this, the three skills of EQ at large. So, because you really have to brace your heart for what your children will tell you when you ask that question. And I really believe that how much your child tells you is a function of how comfortable and safe that they feel. So, 
when I asked my son, when he was around four, the first thing he said was, well, I really feel that you should respect when I don't want to wear the jacket, and I wish you would hug me more. And here I am thinking, what? I practically want to eat this child. And his perception is that he doesn't get enough hugs. And at that moment, it was really painful to my heart. And I'm thinking, I want to showcase to him where I've hugged him in the past. I want to showcase how much time we spent playing. But in that moment, I have to use my own self-regulation and get down to his eye level and, and, and become curious and ask questions to understand how he wants to be loved. My daughter the other day, when I asked her this question, she said to me, Mommy, I feel like sometimes when you kiss me, you hurt my face because you push too hard, and sometimes I just don't want you to touch me. And at that moment, I have to accept that as her truth. So the way I do that is I ask her now, I become very curious to get to the granularity of how she wants to be loved. So can you just explain to me, so when I hug you, do you like the big bear hugs, or do you like the, you know, the soft little hugs, wafty? She goes, no, 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 I like when I ask you to hug me. I said, okay, and I made a footnote. So if, I invite you all to ask that if you have children, ask your children that question. If you have a friend or a lover, because it's very, very seldom as friends. I mean, can you imagine how many friends come up to you and say, hey, you know what, I'm really working on myself. I really have some issues and, I, and I'm trying to, to figure out how I can um, succumb them. And can you teach me, like give them an open invitation. Can you teach me how I can be a better friend or how I can be a better lover or how I can be a better parent? Because then it's safe. You've opened the door for them. And, you're and, and now they have the ability to tell you anything. And then when they tell you what they tell you, you need to use your own self-regulation to be able to handle that. Because that takes a lot of courage to ask that question. But it's a great question. But that's not even the best part of it. After you've asked that question to your children or your friends or your lovers, the real ninja trick comes the next day. The next day when I want to show to them that whatever they said to me was important. Whatever they said to me, I took to heart. And the way I do this is I'll say to my son, oh, so my mommy's really working on her hugs right now, and I've been giving you some hugs. How am I doing? And then he's able to give me that feedback in real time, and this is the benefit of that. A, he gets to do the save as that there's a feedback loop that happens where he can now remember that mommy is working on this, and therefore, you know, she cares. And I, when I get that thumbs up, get to square my shoulders and go, yeah. Mummy's doing a good job. And that way, if you repeat that over time, then A, you get to learn a new skill of how your child wants to be loved and how they want to be touched and how they want to be spoken to and how they want to be kissed. And you get to feel good about it. You get to feel good that you're doing a good job. That doesn't preclude, uh, that doesn't preclude the fact that children also need to learn how to put some love into their own wounds, right? I mean, it's not for me as their parent to always solve all their pain and their issue. Sometimes the conversation is how can you put, when you fall, how can you kiss your own boo-boo? Or how, you, how can you solve your own problem? So uh, this uh, self-awareness, self self-regulation, and perspective taking, uh, how, does this, how does this inform education of the future? We talk about critical thinking. We talk about we should have more meditation, we have more creativity in schools. But the number one predictor of how your child will do is how well you've understood your inner mind such that you can understand your child. And if that's the case, the person that spends the most time with their children is going to be us as the parent. We have a window of opportunity when our children are young to capitalize upon, when those neural connections that are making those deep grooves in their brain to make sure that the connections are the ones that we want. And to think about what is the cost of all those misattuned moments for our children. So for the education, the education of the future has to involve the parent. We have to figure out how, and I have ideas on this, which I won't have time to share today, but how can we involve the parent and create the conversation so there's no blame, there's no shame, there's no feeling of, oh great, there's just one other thing I have to do in my day. How can we involve the parents in the education system, and by the way, the school is the best place. This, having a school, I mean, there's different courses out there, but the school is the best place. And how can we create a dialogue with parents so they feel safe, so they can share all the parts that they don't want to talk about behind closed doors? How can we share that with them and share a new way of interaction so they can have really extraordinary connected relationships with their children? So, 
Um, that's, that's what I have to share with you guys today. Um, and as we think about education of the future, uh, one thing that can certainly be helpful is having a actual school that can house, and, and I, I really do believe that if in line with not just everything we're talking about, but a school of the future would involve something that is built in such a way that is uh, sustainable, environmentally conscious, and something that is in line with what we want our children to embrace. And so I want to invite my husband to come up uh, on stage with me. for, And he's going to be telling you a, about a vision that he had a few years ago to, to build with shipping containers. And uh, before I hand it over to you, I don't know how much you guys know about shipping containers, but I just want to give you the quick down and dirty with them. If you, I, I mean, I'm sure you've all seen shipping container construction. But personally, we think it's one of the coolest mediums to build with. What you've got is really strong court and steel containers that are designed to be stacked nine high and sail the seven seas. These things are termite resistant, mold resistant, earthquake resistant, fire resistant. They're, uh, when you stack and rack them, you can increase their structural integrity. They're modular, so you can continuously add to the size and the shape of it. Literally, it's Lego blocks for grown-ups. And so, since he, I guess, told me he never had enough Lego when he was a child to make cool stuff, here you go, you can talk a bit about what you did. <laughs> G'day, um, I'm Paul, and uh, thanks for the introduction, Ria. So, back in April of 2009, <clears throat> I uh, got the opportunity to go down to the Caribbean and uh, investigate a plot of land that we had access to um, that was near the University of the West Indies. Uh, the demand for students down there was quite high. Sorry, the demand for accommodation was quite high, and we saw this as a wonderful building opportunity to, or investment opportunity to uh, undertake. So um, I was down there for a week, and I was contemplating, contemplating um, how I was going to build it, if I was going to build it at all. And the, the option down there was concrete and block construction. And I'm, I'm a man of the world, I, I, I've travelled, I, I read what's going on in the world um, and one of the things I'm keenly interested in is sustainability and reuse and recycling and so on and so forth. I thought, well, how, how can we incorporate that into that? And I remember reading some articles some months earlier about shipping containers construction and a light just went off in my head and I thought, this has to be done. So. Um, so that was in the April. By the sem September, I would sold a house <clears throat> shipped everything down there, and we literally started uh, the, the process. We break ground a few months later, and you can see on the screen there, we took the delivery of our first couple of containers there. Um, I should mention, all he's ever built before, that was a deck, a really epic deck, but it was just a deck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, f I figured I knew how to swing a hammer, so, uh, you know. <laughs> and again, like Rhea said, this is just Lego blocks for adults, right? So... Um, so Ria mentioned why containers, that these things are indestructible, they spend their lifetime on the back of a truck or a ship, um, and for the intended purpose that we have here, they're really over-designed, so uh, they're, they're a good building material for the infrastructure of a building, relatively cheaply acquired from the local port, and um, it's just a matter of anchoring them to a concrete foundation and cutting out walls and putting in doors and windows and all that sort of good stuff. Um, <clears throat> so, so this building project was going to be, or is, um, 45 20-foot shipping containers. Um, there are 19 studio apartments made with two containers where we remove part of the internal wall so the students can move from one container to the other, and there are two three-container units, sort of a small um, two-bedroom type unit. Um, we, uh, there were two separate days where we took the delivery of the containers. First day we delivered 16, the next day uh, 33. Um, it was a, uh, we presented with lots and lots of challenges during this project because like I said, I'm, I'm not a builder, I am actually build software for a living. But, um, uh, for example, on this day, we started out, the first truck comes into the yard, gets stuck in the mud. 
Um, I had six trucks down the road all lined up ready to come in and no way to get the truck that was in the yard out of the yard. Um, so it was, you know, quick thinking, what do we do, what do we do? So we managed to get a backhoe which came in and plonked down a whole bunch of old bricks and stones and rocks so we were able to move on. Um, I don't think I've ever deserved a beer more than I had um, after that one day, to be honest. But it was a, it was a great day. Um, the first two units we pretty much dropped on the ground, we considered our prototype apartment. And here we learnt what we were going to do for the next 20. We framed the inside with uh, steel uh, studs. You don't want to use wood down there because of the termite problems. We figured out what we were going to do with the bathroom, how we were going to run the plumbing up the back of the buildings, all the utilities, electrical, plumbing, water, hot and cold, waste. Um, and the insides eventually uh, turned into something like this. So put it in laminate floors, tiled kitchen, self-contained kitchen with the fridge, microwave, and the bathroom, uh, the regular stuff, which you sort of saw in the previous photo, shower, sink, basin. We even made all the beds. Um, had a guy sort of uh, fabricate them all on, on site. Um, and these things are going to be indestructible compared to what I might have been able to buy for the same price down at the local uh, furniture shop. Um, <coughs> As we um, cut various holes in various parts of the building, um, I realised we had a, another opportunity to save money again and reuse. For instance, the, the deck pan of the walkways were the walls we cut out from the internal apartments. So we, we'd, we'd cut out an eight foot wall from the inside of the apartment, cut that in half and that becomes the deck pan for the walkway. Uh, all the locking rods on the back of the containers were removed and they became the railings for the walkway. Then um, another thing we had to figure out was how, what's the end result going to look like? What, and what are we going to put on the outside? Are we just going to paint it? I kind of thought no because I don't want you know, um, suburban, you know, this, this suburban, suburban area to be to look like the local port. Well, first so, of all, 45 shipping containers scared the heck out of the Trinidadians when they saw that. So if you can imagine what that looked like for people. Yeah. We, could see the, we could see the end vision, but sorry. Right. We could see the end vision, but I mean, it wasn't until we were kind of front page of the news uh, and not in a good way that we realized that, oh, I don't know if people like this. Uh, so this was, in Trinidad, all they had ever had was containers that were sitting on concrete blocks, not with an entire foundation, and certainly not uh, three stories high. So um, it was the first time this was done in the Caribbean, and it scared a lot of people, and it upset a lot of people. I think lipstick on a pig was the uh, line that I heard online that really stuck with me <laughs> and hurt my feelings, yeah. So... So painting them was, was out of the option. So I looked into a couple of options and ultimately settled on stucco. So the first stage of stucco was to glue inch and a half of polystyrene, the same stuff you would find in your fridge or freezer or chili bin. Um, this is, gives you a great thermal barrier so the sun is not heating up the steel box and turning it into a sweat box. So, um, and on top of that, you would put a fi uh, fiber mesh layer um, onto the outside of the building in preparation for the final coat. And the final product ended up looking like this. So um, here, this is, this is fully complete. We're open for business and uh, people are starting to move in. So the adoption of, of this has, pro has, has uh, been very well received, um, been fully tenanted for the whole time. Uh, I heard a father <clears throat> looking at the units one day and he walked in and he said, oh, nothing but the best for my daughter. And you know, where do I sign sort of thing? So it's been well received by the, by the local community. And um, we've even had the UN approach us to put some thought into providing uh, accommodation slash community into Haiti. Um, and numerous other people have asked us for our, you know, knowledge and how we can assist and whatnot. So, and um, yeah, so... There we go. So there you go. One idea for the school of the future. Thank you so much. So.
got about 10 minutes or so for questions or reflections. Five minutes, apparently. <laughs> Sorry, you may have, have gone over this really quickly when you were showing the construction of how the, the, the boxes go together. So when, when you take out a wall, how do you reinsert the structural integrity? We, we didn't remove the corners. The corners are the main component that, ah. that are structure, structurally rigid. Um, so we left the corners, the, the, the posts alone, mm. and then you know, within a foot down from the, we made the cut. So you're just removing the, the side panel and we only removed eight feet of it, not not the whole wall. Okay. So, because the wall is still part of it too, right? right. So, yeah. What, what's your vision for how you teach parents this um, these emotional skills? So, what I what I've found as I've worked with parents, there seems to be a lot of uh, guilt and shame when that comes up, and in a safe spot, they'll talk about the parts that are difficult and challenging for them. So, my vision would be. You know, in, in a school of the future, um, from the time that, it, first of all, it's known throughout the community that from the time you're pregnant, there's a place that you can go to get, uh, to get information on how, because this starts right at birth, really, and what you can do to create a really connected, uh, attuned relationship with your child. Um, I would also like to see that, you know, there's a very disconnect, there's, there's a disconnection that happens when parents start school with their children. It's almost like the kids, the, the teacher might be trying to forge new relationships with people in the classroom, but the parents don't get that same um, opportunity. I'd love to see um, some buddy systems or little networks or groups that are created, and in it, everyone's able to share through role plays and sh really one, the way I get people to feel comfortable is I share my stories of where I've struggled and where I've got it wrong and where I did lose my mind and I did yell and scream and, and then how I healed afterwards. And there's something about that sharing that allows other people to feel safe when they, when they hear it. So I can imagine that if I had a group of parents and they were now about to send their kids to grade one and they had had no exposure on, on you know, conscious parenting and how to connect, I would love to bring them to a room and try and imagine all the different uh, situations that have, could come up uh, or they could experience. And I found that there's generally five big areas, like five main themes that come up, that if they just understand how to handle, like have enough opportunity to handle those five situations, they can use their own parenting flair and handle almost every situation that comes up in a really connected way. So it's not about you know, years of training here. It's about giving them some really strong fundamentals and giving them a chance to feel the words in their mouth. Yeah. Thank you both very much for sharing your vision. Thank you.